Okay, good morning. Um, this week's tour portion is NASO Make and Accounting. I have to tell you guys the most interesting thing. So I'm in the midst of, I have another, I have a business. So I have a business that I've had for 15 years. And um, I have been in the process of doing a whole bunch of paperwork and catching up on a whole bunch of paperwork for the business um, because I want to sell it and get rid of it. Um, it is so interesting because this week I was doing so much accounting and so much paperwork and I, I was laughing cause I go, you know, start to prepare for this week's study. And I was just floored cause this happens all the time. I was just floored. I went to go start the pre preparation for this week's study and I look up the tour portion and it's make an accounting. <laughs> So I had to laugh because that was my week. I was doing accounting all week. So interesting how that always happens. So we're going to talk about, we're going to go through the book of numbers. There's a huge section in the book of numbers. I'm not going to go through too much in that, um, but I'm going to touch more deeply on the test for the adulterous bride um, and then the Nazarite vows. And we're going to get into that today. Uh, yeah, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all together. We just glorify you. Help us to speak only words that you want us to speak. Help us to have eyes and ears to see the wonderful things in your Torah. Open our eyes and open our ears. Father, remove any witchcraft that has been placed over us from things that we've seen, things that we've watched, things that we've encountered. Father, I just pray that you bind and remove all witchcraft that's been placed over us, Father. I pray, Father, for everyone on this broadcast today. I pray, Father, that you just heal their hearts and minds, that you just work in their lives, that you open eyes and open ears to see the wonderful things in your Torah. Give us brand new revelations today. Show us the deep hidden matters. And I just pray, Father, for your peace. I pray for your peace for our families. I pray for your, your healing of all illness. I pray, Father, uh, that you just deliver us all from anxiety, depression, affliction, anywhere that we need deliverance, Father. I pray that your deliverance will come. I pray, Father, that you just set the captives free. Anywhere that someone is captive, held captive in this life, um, anywhere that they're struggling because of their own sin that they have since repented on, I just pray that you just bring them into repentance and you just deliver them from affliction. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. All right, let's just get into it. Uh, so we are at Numbers 4, uh, 21, Numbers 4, 21. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, take a census of the sons of Gershon also by their father's houses and by their clans. From 30 years old up to 50 years old, you shall list them, all who can come to do duty, to do service in the tent of meeting. This is the service of the clans of the Gershonites in serving and bearing burdens. They shall carry the curtains of the tabernacle and the tent of meeting with its covering and the covering of goatskin that is on top of it and the screen for the entrance of the tent of meeting and the hangings of the court and the screen for the entrance of the gate of the court that is around the tabernacle and the altar, and their cords, and all the equipment for their service. And they shall do all that needs to be done with regard to them. All the service of the sons of the Gershonites shall be at the command of Aaron and his sons, in all that they are to carry, and in all that they have to do. And you shall assign to their charge all that they are to carry. <coughs> I just want to give you a little overview of this quickly so that you're not confused about what's going on here. Um, basically, the, the tribe of Levi is being broken up into the different families and they're, be, they're being given specific jobs to do. Um, Aaron and his sons are in charge, right? Um, and then the other families of the Levites are broken up into different, very specific things that they're supposed to take care of. And that we're just going through the little the the different jobs that they have this is the service of the clans of the sons of the gershonites in the tent of meeting and their guard duty is to be under the direction of ithamar the son of aaron the priest as for the sons of merari you shall list them by their clans and their father's houses 
from 30 years old up to 50 years old, you shall list them, everyone who can come on duty to do the service of the tent of meeting. And this is what they are charged to carry as the whole of their service in the tent of meeting, the frames of the tabernacle with its bars, pillars, and bases, and the pillars around the court with their bases, pegs, and cords, with all their equipment and all their accessories. And you shall list by name the objects that they are required to carry. This is the service of the clans of the sons of Merari, the whole of their service in the tent of meeting, under the direction of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. And Moses and Aaron and the chiefs of the congregation listed the sons of the Kohathites by their clans and their fathers' houses, from 30 years old up to 50 years old, everyone who could come on duty for service in the tent of meeting. And those listed by clans were 2,750. This was the list of the clans of the Kohathites, all who served in the tent of meeting, whom Moses and Aaron listed according to the commandment of the Lord by Moses. So remember last week I was saying that they only worked until the age of 50. This is where that where I got that from. So from 30 to 50, they would work in the temple or the tabernacle at this time, right? And then so from the age of young teenager, mid-teenager to the age of 30, they'd be in training and learning the specific processes. And then from 30 to 50 was there be, would be their years of service. And then after 50, the older um, men would instruct the younger, right? And teach the younger. And they would be there to be... Um, to minister to the younger men to help them so that they would know what to do. Those listed of the sons of Gershon by their clans and their father's houses from 30 years old up to 50 years old, everyone who could come on duty for service in the tent of meeting, those listed by their clans and their father's houses were 2,630. This was the list of the clans of the sons of Gershon, all who served in the tent of meeting whom Moses and Aaron listed according to the commandment of the Lord. Those listed of the clans of the sons of Merari by their clans and their father's houses, from 30 years old up to 50 years old, everyone who could come on duty for service in the tent of meeting, those listed by clans were 3,200. This was a list of the clans of the sons of Merari, whom Moses and Aaron listed according to the commandment of the Lord by Moses. All those who were listed of the Levites, whom Moses and Aaron and the chiefs of Israel listed by their clans and their fathers' houses, from 30 years old up to 50 years old, everyone who could come to do the service of ministry and the service of bearing burdens in the tent of meeting, those listed were 8,580. According to the commandment of the Lord through Moses, they were listed, each one with his task of serving or carrying. Thus, they were listed by him as the Lord commanded Moses. The Lord. Okay, so question. Were those who are Levites who were doing service in the tabernacle allowed to serve and carry? Right. So they, if they were doing service in the tabernacle and they were a Levite, they were allowed to serve, serve and carry. Now, on the Sabbath day. Now, the other thing about this I find interesting is there is no command to not serve or, or to not carry um, on the Sabbath day. So when Yeshua said, pick up your mat, he was not breaking a command. There was no command that you should not be carrying your mat on the Sabbath day. Those were uh, traditional Orthodox commands that have been added in over time. The, I think I went over this a few weeks ago. But the different commands that the rabbis had decided to add to the Sabbath commands all had to do with the different things that you would do in the tabernacle service and the, the way that you would build the tabernacle. So anything like sewing or tearing, um, things like that, anything that would have been done to do to build the tabernacle uh, or build the temple, those things were outlawed to do on the Sabbath day. But the priests were able to do all those things. So if they were in service of the tabernacle, they were able to do all those things. Uh, I just wanted to point that out. But those things that the, the rabbis had added were not written in the Torah. They were commands that were added on 
through rabbinical tradition, right? Okay, so just to clarify that for anybody who didn't understand. So we're at Numbers 5-1. Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous or has a discharge and everyone who is unclean through contact with the dead. You shall put out both male and female, putting them outside the camp that they may not defile their camp in the midst of which I dwell. And the people of Israel did so and put them outside the camp. As the Lord said to Moses, so the people of Israel did. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel. When a man or woman commits any of the sins that people commit by breaking faith with the Lord, and that person realizes his guilt, he shall confess his sin that he has committed and he shall make full restitution for his wrong, adding a fifth to it and giving it to him to whom he did the wrong. But if the man has no next of kin to whom restitution may be made for the wrong, the restitution for wrong shall go to the Lord for the priest, in addition to the ram of atonement with which atonement is made for him. And every contribution, all the holy donations of the people of Israel, which they bring to the priest, shall be his. Each one shall keep his holy donations. Whatever anyone gives to the priest shall be his. Okay, so what is atonement? Atonement is paying the cost for the sin committed. Okay? Atonement is paying the cost for the sin committed. Uh, Yom Kippur is the day of atonement. It is the day where the price of the life is paid. Okay? So this command here is interesting because you know when yeshua says first go go make peace with your brother let's look it up actually matthew 5 Okay, Matthew 5, 21, you've heard it said in said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders is liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council and whoever says you fool shall be liable to the, the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, there, remember that your brother has something against you and leave your gift there before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest the accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So he is referencing back to this section here speak uh speak to the people of israel when a man or woman commits any sin that the people commit by breaking faith with jehovah and the person realizes his guilt he shall confess the sin he has committed and he shall make full restitution for his wrong adding a fifth and giving it to him who he did the wrong okay so this is telling you that they did the wrong against someone else right it's not that they just did the wrong against Yehovah, but in wronging someone else, they also wronged Yehovah, right? And so he shall go and make full restitution for the wrong, adding a fifth to it and giving it to him who he did the wrong. So giving it directly to the person, paying that person back in whatever way is appropriate, um, adding a fifth. But if the man has no next of kin to whom restitution may be made for the wrong, so paying even the next of kin, to make the restitution for the wrong correct the restitution for the wrong shall go to Jehovah for the priest in addition to in addition to the ram of atonement which is paying the price 
uh, with which atonement is made for him for every contribution in all the holy donations of the people of Israel, which shall be for the priest shall be his. Each one shall keep his holy donations. Whatever anyone gives to the priest shall be his. I want to look up donations in Hebrew. One second. Is this numbers four or five? Nope, five, five. Okay, just to show you atonement. So atonement is kafar. Um, and then so that translates to uh, Yom Kippur in different. So in Hebrew, you have, you add letters to the beginning or to the end to say who, if it's a male or female talking or what kind of, what, what adjectives you're using. Um, and then the main word is the root word. So the root word for atonement is kafar. So when you get, you get Yom Kippur from that. Now Yom Kippur, Kippur means to cover. So you are covering, you are paying the cost. So when the high priest goes into the Holy on, of Holies on the day of Yom Kippur, he is paying the cost to cover all of the people. Okay, we'll get more into that when we get closer to the fall feast. But I think that's really important because there's a lot of talk this week that no one can cover another sin. Well, that's exactly what Yom Kippur is. Yom Kippur is the high priest going into the Holy of Holies and covering um, another sin. That is what Yom Kippur is, okay? Making atonement, paying the price, paying the cost on behalf of others, right? Only the high priest works on Yom Kippur. Only the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies. Everyone else is to keep a Sabbath, do no work, right? And then the, the, the high priest does all the work, right? To make atonement, to pay the price, the cost of a life. I'm hoping that hits home and you guys can take that into next week because you might need it. Um, so here, if you're looking on the Zoom, you can see it, the, the price of a life, the ransom, paying the ransom. That's what atonement is, paying the ransom. Um, holy donations. I just wanted to look at that. Interesting. It doesn't really come up in ish. Hmm. The Hebrew is not coming up for it. So I'm not sure what that is in Hebrew. Okay, let's move on. We've got a lot to cover. <clears throat> Test for adultery. Okay. Test for adultery. This is, I believe, the first time you will see this <clears throat> type of test go out. This is the baseline. So when people are talking about understanding prophecy, all prophecy starts with understanding the Torah, the first five books. All prophecy starts, sorry, that's my dad. I just want to uh, I'm just going to pause this. I'm just going to text my dad quick. Cause... Okay, so test for adultery. So as I was saying, the basis of all prophecy is learning the Torah first. Learn the first five books, and that is the root of understanding all prophecy. If you, and I see this all the time, People go and they pluck verses out of Ezekiel, they pluck verses out of Ezra's, and they pluck verses out of um, Enoch, all these places, um, you know, especially the Christians try to read Revelation, but they don't know the Torah and they get it all jumbled. The base, the root, the way that you understand anything pro prophetically is knowing the Torah first. When the test for adultery first shows up, that is giving you the framework to understand every single other time bitter waters are spoken about, wormwood is spoken about. Anytime you see those symbols again repeat, you see them later in Jeremiah, you'll see them in Revelation, you know that he's giving you a picture of a bride, right? A bride that has been. I don't know how to be adulterous, right? She's been, she's been going after other lovers. She's been um, looking at other, other 
you know, places, et cetera, et cetera. Now that is obviously there's the literal, which is if you're married and you're doing that, that's a problem. But there's also the spiritual understanding of we are supposed to be betrothed to Yehovah, right? We're supposed to be betrothed into his kingdom to be his bride, right? And if we are out looking at, um, you know, looking at this religion over here and trying to, and being, I lost my words today, looking at this religion over here and being coveting all their symbols and looking at this religion over here and coveting all their symbols and wanting to bring all their symbols and make sure we're doing, you know, yoga for Yeshua and all this stuff and mixing it all together. We're acting adulterous, right? We're acting a mess instead of, and, and this happens all the time. People, instead of actually learning and studying what the word says, they will be, you know, bringing in all these ideas from the world instead. And they'll be spending all their time ingesting ideas from the world, the world, and then never actually learning what the word says. Right. And that's when Yeshua says, I never knew you because they didn't spend time getting to know his word. Right. Hopefully that makes sense. So we're going to go through the test of the adulterous bride, and then I will show you some places and then you can start to see how this symbol repeats, repeats, repeats throughout the scriptures. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel. If any man's wife goes astray and breaks faith with him, if a man lies with her sexually and it is hidden from the eyes of her husband and she is undetected, though she has defiled herself and there is no witness against her since she was not taken in the act. And if the spirit of jealousy comes over him and he is jealous of his wife who has defiled herself, or if the spirit of jealousy comes over him and he is jealous of his wife, though she has not defiled herself, then the man shall bring his wife to the priest and bring the offering required of her, a tenth of an ephah of barley flour. He shall pour no oil on it and put no frankincense on it, for it is a grain offering of jealousy, a grain offering of remembrance bringing iniquity to remembrance. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthenware vessel and take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and unbind the hair of the woman's head and place in her hands the grain offering of remembrance, which is the grain offering of jealousy. And in his hand, the priest shall have the water of bitterness that brings the curse. Then the priest shall make her take an oath, saying, If no man has lain with you, and if you have not turned aside to uncleanness while you were under your husband's authority, be free from this water of bitterness that brings the curse. But if you have gone astray, though you were under your husband's authority, and if you have defiled yourself, and some man other than your husband has lain with you, then let the priest make the woman take the oath of the curse and say to the woman, The Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people, when the Lord makes your thigh fall away and your body swell. May this water that brings the curse pass into your bowels and make your womb swell and your thigh fall away. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. Then the priest shall write these curses in a book and wash them off into the water of bitterness. And he shall make the woman drink the water of bitterness that brings the curse. And the water that brings the curse shall enter into her and cause bitter pain. And the priest shall take the grain offering of jealousy out of the woman's hand and shall wave the grain offering before the Lord and bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of the grain offering as its memorial portion and burn it on the altar and afterward shall make the woman drink the water. And when he has made her drink the water, then if she has defiled herself and has broken faith with her husband, the water that brings the curse shall enter into her and cause bitter pain, and her womb shall swell, and her thigh shall fall away, and the woman shall become a curse among her people. But if the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive children. This is the law in cases of jealousy when a wife, though under her husband's authority, goes astray and defiles herself, or when the spirit of jealousy comes over a man and he is jealous of his wife. Then he shall set the woman before the Lord, and the priest shall carry out for her all this law. The man shall be free from iniquity, 
but the woman shall bear her iniquity. And the Okay. So obviously there's a lot to think about there. Um, in that time, if you were a woman, and this even happens today in the Middle East, right? In certain countries, if you are a woman and you're suspected, even suspected of doing something wrong, um, you could, you would have been killed, right? Um, so this was actually a protection to the women against the jealous men as well. So it's both sides, right? It was a protection for the woman against the jealous men. So there's multiple stories that you can look them up about women in the Middle East. They were suspected of certain things and they just ended up getting killed, even though there was no evidence. There's no witnesses. There was no this, there was no that, right? Um, which we could talk about the story of the adulterous woman in the New Testament, but there's something I have to tell you guys about that story. It's not found in the original manuscripts. The earliest manuscripts do not have that story. So there is a very high probability that that story was added later, unless we find at some point an earlier manuscript that has that story in it, then it may have been added later. So keep that in mind. I, that's why I never talk about that story, because if I don't know that it actually happened, I'm not going to repeat it, right? And we won't know until... We won't know until we know, right? Two things to note, a couple things to note. Number one, if you ever wonder where the head covering thing came from, um, it comes from this because the priest unbinds her, her hair, right? And that is a picture of removing her covering, the covering of her husband, okay? So a woman is covered by her husband, okay? The idea of covering, the concept of covering is something that goes throughout the scriptures. It starts in Genesis with Adam and Eve. Um, and then it carries on all the way, obviously, into Paul talking about covering when he talks about, uh, when he goes into talking about uh, people acting a mess, which, which is really interesting. I feel like we've talked about this so many times. So if you've been here multiple times, you already know what I'm going to say about this. So I won't get into it fully today but if you want to look at that you look at uh first corinthians 11 so first corinthians 11 paul talks about head coverings right he's using that symbol notice the order he talks about head coverings and then he talks about people eating of the passover eating of the lord's supper while acting inappropriately but getting drunk while being full of nonsense and so they're not having the correct reverence and they're not checking their hearts. They're not checking their behaviors while they eat of the Passover, right? While they're saying that they are in covenant with the most high and that they are his bride, they are essentially being messy, right? And so he says in 1 Corinthians 11, that if you partake of the Passover, right? So you're partaking of the covenant yet you're acting a mess and you're not checking yourself, you could be drinking judgment onto yourself. That is a symbol, right? Why did he start talking with the head covering first? Because he's showing, he's making the understanding, the metaphorical understanding that you are acting like an adulterous bride with her head uncovered. You're, you're not um, acting appropriate and being an appropriate represent, representation of your heavenly husband, right? And that is the picture that goes throughout the scriptures. So you'll see in this, you'll see in this section here that the first thing that happens is she has her head uncovered because she's no longer going to be covered by her husband. A husband can come in uh, and break a wife's vow. So if a wife makes a bad agreement, a wife does something, a husband can come in and cover her sin. He can cover her, her uh, indiscretion or whatever, whatever happened, like if she doesn't, she signs a contract or whatever. He can come in and cover that. I don't know how that would have looked back in that day, but that's essentially the idea. So, sorry, this train is distracting me. Can you hear the train? Uh, so the first thing she does is have her head uncovered, okay? So that's where this head covering thing comes from. It also comes from Isaac and Rebecca. When she meets Isaac, she covers her head. That's a symbol of becoming his bride right okay um so these waters of bitterness that's the symbol that goes out so whenever you see bitter waters being poured out it is telling you 
that your heavenly father is testing the people um, for being adulterous. Okay. So they've come into covenant with Jehovah, but they have been adulterous. They've been looking at the world. They've been doing the things of the world. They have not been keeping his commands. Okay. So let's go into some of these places where you will see this. One of the, one of the biggest places you'll see it is Zechariah 12 to 14. But I think we should do Jeremiah first. It's repeated over and over and over again. Let's do Jeremiah 9. Jeremiah 9. On my head, oh, that my head were, head were waters, and that my eyes fountains of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a, tra a traveler's lodging place, that I may leave my people and go away from them. They, for they are all adulterers, a company of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like the bow. Falsehood and not truth have grown strong in the land. They proceed from evil to evil. They do not know me, declares Yehovah. Do you see those symbols repeating? Right. What does Yeshua say? I never knew you. I never knew you. They were all adulterers, a company of treacherous men. Falsehood, not truth, are strong in the land. Okay. Let everyone be aware of his neighbor. And no, put no trust in any brother, for every brother is a deceiver. Every neighbor goes out, goes about as a slander, and everyone who deceives, everyone deceives his neighbor, and no one speaks the truth. It's train. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves committing iniquity, heaping oppression upon oppression, de deceit upon deceit. They refuse to know me, declares Yehovah. That word no is yada. Yada is to observe, to learn him. Okay. So like you would learn your spouse, right? You're, you get married and you, you know them pretty well, but you get married. But once you get married and you join and you start living together, that's when you really get to know them. Right. And that's that same word that's used to know Yehovah is to grow in observation of him, know what his heart thinks about things, know how he feels about things, study him, right? Don't project yourself onto him, but study him, study what he loves and, you know, ask him to show you what he loves and what he hates so that you can love what he loves and hate what he hates. Therefore says Jehovah of hosts, behold, I will find them and test them. For what else can I do because my because of my people? Their tongue is a deadly arrow. It speaks deceitfully. With each mouth speaks peace to its neighbor. But in his heart, he plans an ambush for him. Shall I not punish them for these things, declares Jehovah? Shall I not avenge it myself on such a nation as this? I will take up weeping and wailing for the mountains, a lamentation for the pastors of the wilderness because they have lain waste and no one passes through the lowering of cattle cattle is not heard both the birds of the air and the beasts of the air and the beasts have fled and gone i will make jerusalem a heap of ruins a lair of jackals and i will make the cities of, of judah a desolation without inhabitant who is the man so wise that he can understand this to whom the mouth of Jehovah has spoken that he may declare it? Why is the land ruined and laid waste like a wilderness so that no one passes through? And Jehovah says, because they have forsaken my law that I set before them, Torah. Sorry, shut this window. Apparently we have the longest train on earth today because they have forsaken my Torah law that I set before him for them and that they have not obeyed my voice and walked with walked in accord with it but have stubbornly father followed after their own hearts and gone after balls um husbands lords owners okay so there's so much confusion about the word ball ball can mean husband but it can also mean other husbands, right? So when you see adultery talked about in the new in the New Testament and Revelation, you see this picture of um, adultery, and a lot of people think that it's the physical adultery with the body, but it's also the adultery going after other gods, right? Going after you know 
those other gods from other nations, right? So when you see Baals in that sense, lords going after other lords, it's a picture of you're not um, keeping Yehovah, your Lord and master, because Baal does not necessarily mean a, the name Baal. That's not necessarily what it means. Usually if they had a Baal, like a Lord that they would follow, it would have another name attached to it. So sometimes you would have like Baal Pior, you can look them up, but there's like a whole, there's lists of them, um, all the different and they, they all were connected to different mountains, different altars, and they would name them different things. Sometimes they're named after trees. Sometimes they were named after altars. Sometimes they're named after, but they were all called balls. That's why this is balls, plural. Okay. Balls means husband. So you're yoking yourself to these other husbands. Okay. And if you don't believe me that ball means husband, um, just go look at Proverbs 31 and look up husband in Proverbs 31. Okay. It doesn't. So. You know, if I was to say father, right? If I were to say father to you, I could mean my earthly father, right? I could mean my dad, uh, who gave, you know, who made me, but then I could also mean my heavenly father, right? Both are true. Okay. So ball could mean depending on the context that you are finding. So every time a Christian says Lord and you say to them, oh, you're saying you're praise, you're worshiping ball, you're wrong. Because they're not necessary, they're not, they're not worshiping ball pure or other balls. Uh, they're saying that Yeshua is their master and their Lord. Okay. Just like Sarah called Abraham her Lord, right? Because he was um, her covering. She would say Lord to Abraham, right? So just keep that in mind that there's a lot of nuance in languages. And if you haven't studied languages, you might not pick up on this. And I find like a lot of people, they go out and they make these memes and they share them and they don't really understand the language. Um, and it causes like just division and confusion for no reason, just really no reason. Okay, so they've stubbornly followed after their own heart, right? So their own heart and they've gone after balls. So the idea is, you know his Torah, you know who he is by studying who he is. So you know the correct image. Then you're not being drug away by your own heart and then having all of this um, bad worship and confusion come in, okay? As their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus says Yehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed this people with bitter food and give them poisonous water to drink. I will scatter them among the nations to whom nations whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send sword after them until I've consumed them. Okay, so you see the picture there. They have been adulterous. They've been going off after these other husbands, right? It doesn't mean that they're actually fornicating necessarily, maybe, maybe not, but they've gone after other gods. And because of that, um, he's going to give them the adulterous bride test. That's that symbol there, right? Um, let's go to... Jeremiah 23 now. Jeremiah 23. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares Jehovah. This is why I speak out against things like people saying Baal means Lord all the time. Um, because if you don't actually explain the nuance of the language correctly, or you don't know, and you're just trying to scatter sheep, this is what you're doing, Right. You don't know enough. You're on Mount Stupid. So I don't know if you've ever seen the chart. Like Mount Stupid is where you think you know a lot, but you actually don't know a lot. I've been up there. And what you discover when you're up on Mount Stupid is that as you're projecting all your, your stupid stuff that you learned um, and you're not really knowing what you're talking about, you get humbled, hopefully. Some people stay up there. A long time but some people get humbled because somebody will come along and show them that they don't know as much as they think they know right and a lot of people are preaching and teaching and they are up on mount stupid preaching and teaching and they're scattering sheep instead of explaining what things actually mean and going through and and learning and being humble about it they're just scattering sheep they're like you don't say the name like me so you know you're not saved etc cetera, etc cetera. So woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares Yehovah. 
Therefore, thus says Jehovah, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away. You have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the, your evil deeds, declares Jehovah. Then I will scatter the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. And I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares Jehovah. Behold, the days are coming, declares Jehovah, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a sadiq. Uh, righteous in government, uh, sprout, growth, uh, sprout, spring up. So I will grow up a righteous leader from, for David, for David, for the house of David, and he shall reign as king. Okay, so who is raising up for David, a righteous branch, Jehovah. Jehovah is raising out for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king, Melech, and deal wisely, and shall execute, judge, uh, execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. Remember that Judah was given the scepter they held on to the torah um, israel was divorced and scattered so israel is often it's like when you say washington right sometimes you mean the leaders of america and sometimes you mean the actual place right it, it just depends and sometimes you mean the state though it can mean all of those things but depending on the context israel can mean the northern tribes that were divorced and scattered right um, Israel can mean just the northern tribes or it can mean everyone back joined together. Okay. But it's because we have Judah here and we have Israel, we have two separate branches, right? And this is the same picture that we see in Ezekiel 37. You have um, the branch of Judah and the branch of Yosef, and they're joined, right? So that's a picture, the exact same picture. The, they will be joined together again. Okay. In his days, his, whose days, the righteous branches days when he reigns as king. Okay. So when in the righteous branches days, as he reigns as king, what'll happen in his days, Judah will be saved. Okay. So when you go out and you say, oh, well, Judah's not saved because da, 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 blah, blah, blah. They're, they're not supposed to be yet. They're, they are saved in his days when he reigns. Is he reigning yet fully? No, absolutely not. So when he reigns, Judah will be saved, okay? And Israel will dwell securely, okay? Israel right now is scattered for the most part. Uh, some people have gone back, but Israel right now is scattered and they're not dwelling securely, right? But in his days, they will dwell securely because they'll be gathered in. The, the test for the adulterous bride has to go up first and those who are found not to be adulterous will be gathered in, the remnant will be gathered in. And this is the name by which he will be called. Uh, Yo uh, Yehovah is our righteousness. I want to look that up in Sadiq. Sadiq is our righteousness. Hmm. I want to look that up in Hebrew later more. It's just giving me his the, the name. This is the name by the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. Okay, I'll look that up later. Sometimes this program, it doesn't show you all the Hebrew. It just translates certain words. Uh, therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares Yehovah, when they shall no longer say, as Jehovah lives, who brought the people up out of the out of, the people up out of Israel and out of the land of Egypt. And as Jehovah lives, who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel to, out of the north country and out of the countries where he had driven them, where they dwell, then they shall dwell in their own land. Concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me and my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, a man overcome with wine because of Jehovah. And because of his holy words, the land is full of adulterers 
And because of the curse, the land mourns. So we see the curse, the adulterers is connected with the curse, right? And the pastures of the wilderness are dried up and their course is evil and their might is not right. Both prophet and priest are ungodly. And even in my house, I have found their evil declares Yehovah. Therefore, therefore their way shall be to them like slippery paths in the darkness in which they shall be driven and fall. I will bring disaster upon them in the year of their punishment declares Yehovah. In the prophets of Samaria, I saw an unsavory thing. They prophesied by Baal. And they led my people astray. So they're prophesying by their false gods. Okay. And I had prayed, I had prayed about this and thought and meditated on this for a while. And what Abba showed me is, you know, those people, like a lot of times they talk, like it's especially, unfortunately, really popular with women. And they'll go on, they'll be like, oh, your kingdom spouse is coming and all this nonsense, or oh, your your abundance is coming. You're, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get abundance and all this stuff. And they post this stuff on YouTube or they do it in church or whatever. They are prophesying from the idols of their own heart. Okay. So they have an eye. They are prophesying to you from the idols of your heart and the idols of their heart. So if you have an idol in your heart that you want to have a bunch of money and that's what's important to you, or you need to have a, a certain spouse and that's, what's important to you. When the prophecies are being prophesied, they're prophesying by the false idols that are already in your heart, okay? So when these girls are going through and they're watching all these kingdom spouse videos and they're just idolizing having a spouse or having a marriage and that's become an idol to them, they're, that's able to happen to them because the idol is in their heart already and that person making that prophecy, the idol is in their heart already. So they're prophesying by, by their false gods, right? The false god is the the idolatry towards marriage or the idolatry towards money or whatever the the process is. And you'll also see this talked about in Ezekiel fifteen. In Ezekiel fifteen, he talks about like if you will not humble yourselves and remove the idolatry from your heart, if you will not remove just all those idols from your heart, then he will confirm your idols to you. So a lot of people are. I whenever I post a, a video about you know bacon or pork or something like that you get the weirdest, the strangest comments, but a lot of times people say, well, I prayed about it. And Abba said, it's okay that I eat pork or bacon, even though his word says it's not okay. I heard that it's okay. Okay. Ezekiel 15 says, if you didn't tear down that idol and humble yourself before his word and what he says in his word first, you'll, you'll be confirmed by the balls. Th those, those idols were, will, he'll, he'll leave that door open to confirm whatever to you. That's why whatever you hear and whatever you, whatever's confirmed to you, you check with the word, right? And the word trumps whatever you've heard, right? They prophesied by Baal and they led my people astray. But in the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers and so that no one turns from his evil. All of them have become like Sodom to me and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. Therefore, thus says Jehovah of hosts concerning the prophets, I will feed them with bitter food. I will give them poisoned water to drink from the prophets of Jerusalem ungodliness has gone out into all the land thus says Jehovah of hosts do not listen to the word of the prophets who prophesy to you filling you with vain hopes worthless proud hopes false hopes they speak visions of their own mind own minds not from the mouth of Jehovah they say continually to those who despise the word of Yehovah, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows uh, his own follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. Okay. I'm assuming most of you are catching like how specific this is. So when people say to you, oh, he knows my heart. Yeah, he does know your heart. <laughs> it's filled with vain hopes. It's filled with visions of your own mind. And it's not from the mouth of Yehovah. You despise the word of Yehovah. 
and you say it shall be well with you, but you stubbornly follow after your own heart and that you say no disaster shall come upon you. For who among you has stood in the council of Yehovah to hear and see, to see and hear his word? Who has paid attention to his word and listened? Behold, the storm of Yehovah, wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of Yehovah will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. If they had stood in my counsel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from their evil deeds. So if there's a prophet prophesying or a preacher preaching, what does prophecy mean? Prophecy, prophecy means to speak the words of Yehovah. It means, uh, let's see. A spokesman, a prof, a prophet is a spokesman. So you are speaking on behalf of Yehovah. So if you are speaking on behalf of Yehovah, but you have not stood in his council to make sure that you are proclaiming his words to his people, to turn them from their evil way, to turn them from their evil deeds, then you are prophesying falsehood. So anyone that you see just running their mouth, oh, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. They do not understand the scriptures. They have not stood in his counsel. All prophecy is the testimony of Yeshua, testimony of salvation. Salvation is turning, repenting, turning from your ways to Yehovah's ways. Does this make sense? Okay. If they had stood in my council, then they would have proclaimed my words, his words, to my people. And they would have turned from their evil way and from their evil deeds. So if you see churches that are preaching anything against his commandments, against his words, instead of preaching exactly what his words say, you see a pastor there who is preaching something that is not what the word says. That means that pastor has not stood in his counsel. Okay. Jeremiah 23, 23. I am an Elohim at hand, declares Jehovah, not an Elohim far away. Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares Jehovah? Did I not fill the heaven and earth, declares Jehovah? Have I not, have I heard? I have heard what the prophets have said, have said, who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart, who make, who th think to make my people forget my name by their dreams and tell one another, even as the fathers have forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has dreamed has a dream, tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, declares Jehovah? Is not my word like fire, declares Jehovah, like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares Jehovah, who steal my words from one another. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares Jehovah, who use their tongues and declare, declares Jehovah. Behold, I am against all those who prophesy lying dreams, declares Jehovah, and who tell them and lead my people astray by their lies and their recklessness. Recklessness. And when I did not send them or charge them, so they do not profit this people at all, declares Jehovah. Okay, this line is really important. I see this recklessness on the internet all of the time. People think a thought and they just make a video and they just get up on their platform, platform, and they elevate themselves and they feel like they have the right to just make a video speaking about Yehovah and they're not careful about it. And that comes with this recklessness which is insolence, arrogance, and with the implication of recklessness, boastfulness, okay? Oh, I think this, and I'm going to just post it on the internet, and not considering that they might be scattering sheep, 
that they might be causing confusion, that they might be sowing seeds uh, that are tares into people's faith. They are not being careful and they don't have fear of Yehovah. If you're doing that, if you're just recklessly posting videos like, oh, well, I think this and that and da, 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 and you have not studied it out and you have not fasted and prayed, but you're just running your mouth on the internet. That, that is a thing that should make you tremble because you're going to be responsible. Anytime that you've sowed a tear, anytime that you have scattered a sheep, you're going to be responsible for what you did. The, the, the blood will be on your hands, right? Um, so just be aware of that and be aware that you're not ingesting what these people are saying when they're recklessly, when they're just boastfully and pridefully. You can see the pride on people. You can see it. You can see it on them. Their name calling usually, they're, they're just reckless. They're boastful. They have it all figured out and nobody else does. There's no fear of Yehovah. If you are posting videos saying, thus says Yehovah, this is his word, this is what his word says, and you don't walk in that fear and reverence of him as you're doing that, you don't have your head covered and understanding that you're coming in his name and you're doing it in vanity in any way, that is a very scary thing. That is a very scary thing. Trust me. Like, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take this on for the, you know, <laughs> I do what I'm told, but you have to take it very seriously. It's a very scary thing. So they do not profit this people at all, declares Jehovah. So when you are speaking and when you're posting something on the internet, are you profiting his people? Are you growing them? Are you, are you availing them? Are you benefiting them? Or are you scattering them and destroying them, uh, destroying their faith? Are you healing them? Are you restoring them? Are you leading them to peace and truth? Or are you damaging them? That's a really important question to ask as you post videos on the internet. Um, or on Facebook. Or when you share a Facebook meme. Or when you share something anywhere. Is this a profit to his people? Is this helping and healing and benefiting them? Is it teaching them properly, right? If you're not sure, just don't, just wait on it, okay? Jeremiah 23, 33. When one of this people or, or, a, or a prophet or priest asks you, what is the burden of Yehovah? Masa, what is the load, the burden of Yehovah? You shall say to them, you are the burden. And I will cast you off, declares Jehovah. As far as for the prophet or priest or one who, or one of the people who says, who says the burden of Jehovah, I will punish this man and his household. Thus you say, every one to his neighbor and every one to his brother. What has Jehovah answered? What has Jehovah spoken? But the burden of Jehovah you shall mention no more, for the burden is every man's own word, and you pervert the words of the living Elohim. The, the Yehovah of hosts are Elohim. Thus, you shall say to the prophet, what has Yehovah answered you and what has Yehovah spoken? And, but if you say the burden of Yehovah, thus says Yehovah, because you have said these words, the burden of Yehovah, I will send to, when I send to you saying, you shall not say the burden of Yehovah. Therefore, behold, I will surely lift you up cast you away from my presence and the city that I gave to you and your father. So be cast out of New Jerusalem, right? New Jerusalem is that picture of the final kingdom where the, the remnant is gathered in. So they'll be cast out like Laodicea is spit out, right? And I will bring upon you everlasting reproach and perpetual shame, which is not forgotten. So what is burden? Uh, tribute uh a burden tribute specifically or abstractly so what you're carrying right what you're carrying for Yehovah. so what is the burden of Yehovah? you shall say to them you often declares Yehovah. so they think they're doing the works of Yehovah, but they're actually the burden they're actually <laughs> you shall say to them you are the load and i will cast you off you're you're being a load upon the people so these false prophets 
They're putting a heavy load upon the people. They're causing confusion. They're not bringing profit to the kingdom. Okay, let's go to Revelation 8. And you can see how this carries on over and over and over again. I'm not going to read all of Revelation 8. It just goes through the seals. But I just want to show you Revelation 8.10. 8.10. And the third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and the springs of water. And the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. Okay. So the waters will be made bitter and people will drink. Now, the test for the adulterous pride, there's two things that happen. If you have not been adulterous, you will flourish and you will multiply. I think we read that in Jeremiah 9. So the so the test is if the bride has not been adulterous, she will flourish and multiply. If she has been adulterous, she will rot and die, right? Her thigh will rot, her womb will rot, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, wormwood is also a herb that can kill parasites, by the way, in small doses. I have to tell you a really cool story. My, so my mom has only been coming to Passover for the last two years. She just started to understand these things. And this year she came to passport, came to uh, Passover and I asked her to bring the bitter herb salad. Now my mom's very into herbs and stuff. And she just happened to have some wormwood in her garden and she brought a bitter herb salad for Passover and it had wormwood in it. I thought that was so cool. She had no idea what it meant. Um, she was just telling me about the salad. I was like, okay, what's in the salad mom? And she was like, oh, I put wormwood in it. I'm like, oh, that's so amazing. Like you have no idea what that means, but you went and put wormwood in our salad for Passover. I thought it was great. Okay. So we're going to go to Zachariah. I hate this computer sometimes. Zechariah 12, 12, 13, Zechariah 13. And on that day, there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanliness. In at the feast of Sukkot, you remember when Yeshua uh, goes and he says, I'm the fountain of living water at the feast of Sukkot in the New Testament right on that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of david and the inhabitants of jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanliness so it's a picture of the living waters going out okay and the living can do the test for the adulterous bride it can do one or two things right and on that day declares jehovah of hosts i will cut off the names of the idols for from the land so that they shall be remembered no more and i will remove the land from the land the prophets and the spirit of uncleanliness. And if anyone again prophesies, his father or mother who bore him will say to him, you shall not live, for you speak lies in the name of Yehovah. And his father and mother who bore him shall pierce him through where he prophesies. Pierce him through where he prophesies. Okay, so there's also this picture of being pierced through when you're being, you're prophesying by Baal. And that's the picture of, uh, it's in numbers later on. I don't think we've got Pinhas. When Pinhas is cleansing the camp, he has to, he pierces through someone to cleanse the camp. Okay. Uh, and that's that picture that, that if somebody starts to do this prophesy thing again, pierce them through, you know, it's really interesting. Um, this week I came across all this stuff from Bethel, you know, Bethel, the church. Um, and they have all these like prophecy plans that you can get and they're like these plans that they're selling and you get prophecy from their profits they're like thousands of dollars it's absolutely disturbing this is the kind of stuff that they're talking that he's talking about right just prophesying over people and speaking lies in the name of Yehovah. and it's it's no different than going to a, a fortune teller it's no different than looking at your horoscope. It's the same, it's the same stuff, right? And so when he removes the idols from everything, from the land, right? 
He's going to remove all the prophets. No one will prophesy in that way. You shall not live for you speak lies in the name of Yehovah. On that day, every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. He will not put on a hairy cloak in order to deceive, but he will say, I am no prophet. I am a worker of the soil. For a man sold me in my youth. And if anyone asks him, what are these wounds on your back? He shall see, he shall say, these wounds I received in the house of my friends. Awake, 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 O sword, against the shep, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares Jehovah of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones, and in the whole land, declares Jehovah, two thirds shall be cut off and perish and one third shall be left alive and i will put this third into the fire and i will refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested you see this same language in revelation 3 when yeshua talks about the church of laodicea i will put this third in the fire and refine them as one refined silver so he talks about um getting buying gold refined by fire right they will call upon my name and I will answer them. They will say these, they are my people. And they will say, Yehovah. And I will say they are my people. And, and they will say, Yehovah is my Elohim. So after he's refined them and put them through the fire, they will get it. They'll, it'll, they'll finally get it. And then that's when they will understand, right? And become his people. Behold, the day is coming for Yehovah when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst for i will gather all the nations against jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and the women graped half of the cities shall go half of the city shall go into exile the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city and then jehovah will go out and fight against those who nation whose those nations when he set when he fights on the day of battle on that day his feet shall stand on the mount of olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east to the west by a very wide valley so that one half of the Mount shall move forward and the other half southward. Okay. So there's this doctrine coming, going around that this has all already happened. Now, if this has all already happened, what the question that I want to ask you is where is that valley, the very wide valley and how, and how has the Mount of Olives been split? That's the question I want to ask for those who say this has all already happened, right? Food for thought. You shall flee uh, to the valley of, of my mountains, for the mountains shall reach to Azel. And you shall flee as you fled from an earthquake uh, in the fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, when Jehovah my Elohim will come. Then Jehovah my Elohim will come, and all the holy ones with him. All the holy ones with him, the Kadosh ones, the separated ones with him. So as he's landing, he has those who are separated ones with him as his feet land on Mount Olives and split Mount Olives and make a wide valley. So has that happened yet? Not that I know of. On that day, there shall be no light, cold, or frost. It shall be a unique day, which is known to Yehovah, neither day nor night, but at evening time, there shall be light. On that day, living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea, and it shall continue in summer as in winter. And Yehovah will be king over all the earth. And on that day, Yehovah will be one and his name one. So is Yehovah king over all the earth? He is. He is, but do we see that? I don't know. It's tough to say. Because some people might say, well, Yeshua, when Yeshua died, there was an earthquake. And, but did it make a wide valley? I don't think there's a wide valley there. I guess you could make that argument. The whole land shall be turned into a plain. The whole land's not turned into a plain. From Geba to Rimen to the south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem shall may, remain aloft on its on its site. From the gate of Benjamin to the, 
to the place of the former gate, to the corner gate, to the tower of Hanel, to the king's wine presses, and it shall be inhabited, and there shall never be again be a decree of utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. So is Jerusalem dwelling in security now? Or are they under threat constantly? Right? So, yeah, we definitely have not seen this happen. So tell your preterist friends. Uh, and this shall be the plague with which Yehovah will strike all the people that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they're still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. So that is an image of the adulterous bride test, right? And on that day, a great panic from, from Yehovah shall fall upon them and each will seize the hand of another and the hand of another will be raised against the hand of another. Even Judah will fight at Jerusalem. The wealth of all the surrounding nations will be collected gold and silver and garments in great abundance and the plague and a plague like this plague shall fall on the horses, the mules, the camels and the donkeys or whatever beast shall be made in the, maybe in those camps. And everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, Yehovah of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths, Sukkah, the, the tabernacles feast. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Yehovah of hosts, the king, Melech, Yehovah of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And, and if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then there shall be no rain and there shall be and there shall be the plague with which Jehovah afflicts the nations who do not go up and keep the feast of booths. This shall be this shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations who do not go up to keep the feast of booths. Okay. So they will be keeping biblical feasts in the millennial reign. And on that day, there shall be inscribed in the bells of the horses, holy to Yehovah. And the pots of the house of Yehovah shall be uh, as the bulls before the altar. And every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to Yehovah of hosts, so that all who sacrifice who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them. And there shall be no longer be a traitor in the house of Yehovah of hosts on that day. So as well, it seems as though they are sacrificing meat at this time in the millennial reign. So tell your Christian friends, I don't think they're aware of that. Um, okay, what else was I gonna tell you guys about? If you want to look, if you just look up other verses of Wormwood, um, Proverbs 5, 4, but in the end, she is bitter as Wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Lamentations, remember my affliction, my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. So there's a few wormwood references. You'll start to see them everywhere now. Bitter waters, wormwood. That's a that's a symbol for being tested as a bride to Yehovah, right? All right, let's move on to the Nazarite vow. So we're at numbers six. Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink and shall not drink any juice of grapes or eat grapes fresh or dried. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine not even the seeds or the skins. All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall touch his head. Until the time is completed for which he separates himself to the Lord, he shall be holy. He shall let the locks of hair of his head grow long. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body, not even for his father or for his mother or brother or sister. If they die, shall he make himself unclean because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation, he is holy to the Lord. And if any man dies very suddenly beside him, and he defiles his consecrated head, then he shall shave his head on the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day, he shall shave it. On the eighth day, he shall bring two turtle doves or two pigeons to the priest 
to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and the priest shall offer one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering, and make atonement for him, because he sinned by reason of the dead body. And he shall consecrate his head that same day, and separate himself to the Lord for the days of his separation, and bring a male lamb a year old for a guilt offering. But the previous period shall be void, because his separation was defiled. And this is the law for the Nazarite, when the time of his separation has been completed. He shall be brought to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and he shall bring his gift to the Lord, one male lamb a year old without blemish for a burnt offering, and one ewe lamb a year old without blemish as a sin offering, and one ram without blemish as a peace offering, and a basket of unleavened bread, loaves of fine flour mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers smeared with oil, and their grain offering and their drink offerings. And the priest shall bring them before the Lord and offer his sin offering and his burnt offering, and he shall offer the ram as a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord, with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall offer also its grain offering and its drink offering. And the Nazarite shall shave his consecrated head at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and shall take the hair from his consecrated head, and put it on the fire that is under the sacrifice of the peace offering. And the priest shall take the shoulder of the ram when it is boiled, and one unleavened loaf out of the basket, and one unleavened wafer, and shall put them on the hands of the Nazarite, after he has shaved the hair of his consecration. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. They are a holy portion for the priest, together with the breast that is waved, and the thigh that is contributed. And after that the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite. But if he vows an offering to the Lord above his Nazarite vow, as he can afford, in exact accordance with the vow that he takes, then he shall do in addition to the law of the Nazarite. Okay, I want to just look up this in Hebrew. One sec. Okay, so what is a vow? Nadar? A vow. Uh, to promise to do or give something to Yahuwah. So it is making a promise to give something to Yahuwah. So in this case, the Nazarite, Nazir, singled out one or consecrated one, means to dedicate or consecrate oneself. That's what Nazir means. And it's also to set something apart, Nezer. Um, and then a class of people who separated themselves. And Nazar is, I think this is the one I'm looking for. Nope. Keep separate. Means uh, separated, consecrated one, basically. To abstain, uh, separation, dedication to Yehovah, to deity, crown, a sign of consecration, a Nazarite, a class of people dedicated to Yehovah. It's really interesting as Nazar is very closely associated to the word Noah, letter-wise. That's interesting. Um, sorry, just looking through these. Okay. So the Nazarite is one that's singled themselves out and consecrated themselves, separated themselves unto Yehovah. Um, this was something that people could do. They, a lot of times people feel like the people in the priesthood have this special closeness to Yehovah. They get to draw in, in a special way because of their Levitical bloodline. But this was something that people could do to separate themselves because the Levitical priesthood had extra commands that they had to follow, right? So if you were a priest in the priesthood, you would have extra commands that you would follow. But if you were um, someone giving the offerings, you're a son of Aaron, you would have even more commands that you would follow. And also you wouldn't be drinking strong drink while in 
in the tabernacle. And then if you obviously were the high, the high priest, you had even more commands that you had to follow to be even more separated. And so this was a way for anyone to draw near to Yehovah and become more separated and more um, holy unto him and consecrate themselves more unto him. And this was a way that they could do it and separate themselves for Yehovah without being a Levite, right? Without being a Kohen. Um, so they wouldn't drink strong drink. They would not eat grapes, fresh or dried. In all the days of their separation, they will eat nothing produced by the grape grapevine or even the seeds or the skins. And then they would not cut their hair until the time of their vow was completed. And they would let their locks grow long which is very fascinating to me. Samson had, we're going to read Samson next, and he had long, long hair that he had grown his whole life. Um, something very spiritual in the hair about that. It's very interesting. And they were not to go near a dead body, not even if their father, mother, or brother died. They were not to go near a dead body during their time of separation. Uh, the priests as well were not supposed to go near dead bodies. They had to um, do the red half so that's where the whole red heifer thing comes in they had to do the red heifer sacrifice for the priests to be able to work in the tabernacle or the temple in the future right let's carry on we're going to go into aaron's blessing so the ironic blessing was spoken over the people and it is very beautiful in hebrew I hope i can find it Ronic blessing in Hebrew. I try to say it, but I just don't think it's appropriate for me to say it. Um... Shalom. My name is Ayelet. I was born and raised in Israel. And... No, I just want to hear it. You've got a subscription for streaming movies, music. Of course, we had to add. Is this a whole song? Okay, so that's basically it. Um, and if you want to look that up on YouTube and stuff, you'll probably find a lot of different versions of people saying it. When they say Adonai, that is uh, the Jewish word for Lord. So they say Adonai or Hashem. Um, I say Yehovah. Uh, so that's why they have Adonai there, just in case you're curious. So the Aaronic blessing, let's listen to it in English. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his son, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. On the day. So they're, they're speaking his name over the people and giving them the, their blessing to put his name upon them. And you see that picture in Revelation 3 with different things as well with the churches. And further on in Revelation, you see his name being put on people as well. All right, number 7-1. We're almost there. This is a long one. When Moses had finished setting up the tabernacle and had anointed and consecrated it with all its furnishings, and had anointed and consecrated the altar with all its utensils. The chiefs of Israel, heads of their father's houses, 
who were the chiefs of the tribes, who were over those who were listed, approached and brought their offerings before the Lord, six wagons and twelve oxen, a wagon for every two of the chiefs, and for each one an ox. They brought them before the tabernacle. Then the Lord said to Moses, Accept these from them, that they may be used in the service of the tent of meeting, and give them to the Levites, to each man according to his service. So Moses took the wagons and the oxen and gave them to the Levites. Two wagons and four oxen he gave to the sons of Gershon, according to their service. And four wagons and eight oxen he gave to the sons of Merari, according to their service, under the direction of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest. But to the sons of Kohath he gave none, because they were charged with the service of the holy things that had to be carried on the shoulder. And the chiefs offered offerings for the dedication of the altar on the day it was anointed. And the chiefs offered their offering before the altar. And the Lord said to Moses, They shall offer their offerings, one chief each day, for the dedication of the altar. He who offered his offering the first day was Nashon, the son of Amminadab, of the tribe of Judah. And his offering was one silver plate, whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, one golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Nashon, the son of Amminadab. On the second day, Nathanael, the son of Zuar, the chief of Issachar, made an offering. He offered for his offering one silver plate, whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, one golden dish of 10 shekels, full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Nathanael, the son of Zuar. On the third day, Eliab, the son of Helon, the chief of the people of Zebulun, his offering was one silver plate, whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, one golden dish of ten shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a bird offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Eliab the son of Helon, on the fourth day, Elizer, the son of Shedir, the chief of the people of Reuben, his offering was one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, one golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Elijah, the son of Shedir. On the fifth day, Shalumiel, the son of Zerashaddai, the chief of the people of Simeon. His offering was one silver plate, whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, one golden dish of ten shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Shalumiel, the son of Zerushaddai, on the sixth day, Eliasaph, the son of Duel, the chief of the people of Gad, his offering was one silver plate, whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, 
both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, one golden dish of ten shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Eliasaph, the son of Duel. On the seventh day, Elishama, the son of Amihud, the chief of the people of Ephraim, his offering was one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, one golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Elishama, the son of Amihud. On the eighth day, Gamaliel, the son of Pedazer, the chief of the people of Manasseh, his offering was one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, one golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Gamaliel, the son of Pedazer. On the ninth day, Abidin, the son of Gideonai, the chief of the people of Benjamin, his offering was one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, one golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Abidin, the son of Gideonai. On the tenth day, Ahazer, the son of Amashaddai, the chief of the people of Dan, his offering was one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, one golden dish of ten shekels, full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Ahiezer, the son of Amashaddai. On the eleventh day, Hegel, the son of Okran, the chief of the people of Asher, his offering was one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, one golden dish of ten shekels, full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Pegiel, the son of Okran. On the twelfth day, Hira, the son of Enon, the chief of the people of Naphtali. His offering was one silver plate, whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, one golden dish of ten shekels, full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Ahira, the son of Enon. This was the dedication offering for the altar on the day when it was anointed, from the chiefs of Israel, twelve silver plates, twelve silver basins, twelve golden dishes, each silver plate weighing 130 shekels, and each basin 70, all the silver of the vessels, 2,400 shekels according to the shekel of the sanctuary, the twelve golden dishes full of incense, weighing ten shekels apiece according to the shekel of the sanctuary, all the gold of the dishes being 120 shekels, all the cattle for the burnt offering, twelve bulls, twelve rams, twelve male lambs a year old, with their grain offering, and twelve male goats for a sin offering, and all the cattle for the sacrifice of peace offerings, twenty-four bulls, the rams, sixty, the male goats, sixty, the male lambs, a year old, sixty. This was the dedication offering for the altar after it was anointed. And when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony, from between the two cherubim, and it spoke to him. Ooh. Um, did anybody else catch the witchcraft in... So this was 12 days of offerings and Israel is bringing their offerings to Yehovah over 12 days. You know that song, the 12 days of Xmas? <clears throat> there is so much witchcraft and deception in Xmas. And the only way that people spot it is they sit here and they go through the scriptures and then they start to see these things because I never noticed this before. 
12 days of offerings from the sons of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel to dedicate the altar to Yehovah. And then what do people sing at Xmas time? 12 days of Xmas, where they talk about their true love, giving. So they're it's just, it's such a mockery and you would never see it unless you spend the time going through the scriptures. Um, we've gone through this before. So Moshe goes to the tent of meeting to speak to Yehovah and he hears the voice speaking to him above the mercy seat, which is in the Ark of the Testimony between the two cherubim. And it spoke to him. So when you look at the Catholic throne where the Pope sits, there's two cherubim and he's sitting on a seat and he's speaking. Okay. So if you want to know where the Antichrist is, he's sitting on a throne in the Vatican, speaking as Yehovah from a seat with cherubim, changing the laws. Okay. So the Antichrist should not be hard to spot. It should be pretty obvious. Um, I don't know if anyone else has noticed. I know we talked about this last week, but the growth of the Catholic Church recently and the way that all of these famous people are directing people to the Catholic Church, uh, Chosen directs people to the Catholic Church. So that, the actor from Chosen, he directs people to the Catholic Church. Um Russell Brand is directing people to the Catholic Church. Marky Mark from the Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch is directing people to the Catholic Church. It's all over the place right now. Um, and that is where the Antichrist is seated, okay? He is seated on the throne, um, alive and well in the Catholic Church. Will we see another more obvious manifestation? Yes, well, I think we'll see many obvious manifestations of Antichrist. Um, spirits and all sorts of, you know, we'll see me, I think we will see one main um, thing, but it's interesting. It's interesting. I don't, I'm not sure what's going to happen, you know, moving forward, but it's very obvious when you look at the throne in Rome and where the Pope sits and how he changes the laws and stuff. It's exactly what the scripture said would happen, right? All right, we're going to move to Judges and talk about Samson. I just need a quick break, and I will be right back. We are in Judges uh, 13. I find it so fascinating how they do these Torah portions. It says that the Torah portion starts in Judges 13, 2. But I'm going to read Judges 13, 1 to you, and you'll see why they removed it. And the people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of Jehovah. So Jehovah gave them into the land of the Philistines for 40 years. Now, a question people always have is, are the Philistines the Palestinians that we have now? The name is was given to the people, the Palestinian people now, um, by Rome. So Rome actually named them. Um, I think it was back in the 40s or whatever. And don't quote me on that, but there's no evidence that they were the original Philistines. Like we don't know if they were the original Philistines. They're just Arab people from that area um, who have been shuffled about and used as pawns in, in lots of ways as well. Uh, so do we know that they're the original Philistines? We don't know that. We can make guesses, but maybe. Let's go to the Torah portion. So the people of Israel did evil in the sight of Yehovah once again, and that is why they were delivered into the hands of the Philistines. So if you are in a nation that has been delivered into the hands of your enemies, and you feel like you are being oppressed by the enemy, there's a very strong chance that the reason is, is that your nation has been doing evil in the sight of Yehovah. So instead of blaming your politicians, um, let people know that that is why they've been delivered into the hands of their enemies is because they have done what is evil in the sight of Yehovah. Judges 13, 2. 
there was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God, very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life, and what is his mission? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, or eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If you detain me, I will not eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, so that when your words come true, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering, and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders, and Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands, or shown us all these things, or now announced to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son, and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him, and Mahanadan, between Zorah and Eshtael. Okay, a few things I just want to point out. So he was set aside to be a Nazarite from birth. So he, so usually the Nazarite vow would be a set period of time, and then you would take it upon yourself. He was set out from birth to be a Nazarite. So from the day he was conceived onward. Um, so that is why the woman was told not to drink any strong drink, etc. Back in that day, I would assume that, you know, many people would have been drinking a little bit of wine. You wouldn't have had, you know, we have all these beverages today, but wine would have been something common that people would drink. And even if you had grape juice just sitting out, it would turn to wine and ferment quite quickly in the heat, right? So they didn't have refrigeration. So all of these things will come into play. Uh, I just want to point out that the angel of Yehovah came to the woman. I just find this amusing. Okay. You can get mad at me if you want. The angel of Yehovah came to the woman, told her the details. She went and told her husband and her husband was like, wait, I got to check for myself. <laughs> I don't believe her. Cause that goes back to the garden, right? That goes back to the garden. Um, 
it, and you see it all the time. Like a woman can say stuff and a man literally will not believe her until he hears it for himself or hears it from another man. It is such a common thing. Fair enough. Fair enough. I don't, it's it's it came from the garden that's like gar a garden problem it's been around forever because it's like it's almost like ingrained in men to not believe women anymore and to not listen to women anymore because of the garden um so it's like a deeply ingrained thing but you also notice that there's so many times in the scripture where uh the angel of Yehovah comes to the woman first when when Yeshua rose from the dead um, he came first, he was show. he appeared first to women, right? Um, so there's a lot of these circumstances where the woman is the one who's given the message first. When Mary is told she's going to conceive, she's given the message first, and then her husband's given the message later, right? Um, so her husband goes and prays and says, bring the man back. I need to hear it for myself. Tell me what, what we're supposed to do. Um, and so then the, the, the angel of Yehovah comes back again, right? Um, the other thing is to notice is when Manoah said to the angel of Yehovah, let us detain you and prepare a young goat for him, for you. Uh, if you detain me, I will not eat of your food. If you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to Yehovah. So this is an example of the angel of Yehovah making it very clear that we do not give offerings to angels. We do not give offerings to anyone else except for Yehovah directly, right? And then Man Manoah says to the angel of Yehovah, what is your name? So that when your words come true, we may honor you. And the angel of Yehovah says to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing as it is, one, as it is wonderful. So that, that word in Hebrew, wonderful, is, an, is a word for a hidden thing. It is something that's too grand for us to understand. It's a hidden thing of Yehovah. We're not supposed to seek out the hidden things of Yehovah so that we can honor them or manipulate them or, or anything like that. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's actually multiple, I think there's a few different scrolls that were found within the Dead Sea Scrolls where they were actually prayers to invoke angels directly. Um, and I think that, uh, Solomon also played with this and that's kind of where Solomon ended up in idolatry with that wives and stuff. And he was playing with all this different things and in invoking the angels. And that's very much tree of knowledge level stuff, right? When you're starting to try to invoke angels or make offerings to angels in order to get your, what you want, um, that's witchcraft, right? So that's, you know, when you see witches and warlocks and all that, they're giving offerings to angels fallen angels and they're invoking fallen angels that's tree of knowledge that's witchcraft that's using um, the demonic realm to try to have personal gain right we're not supposed to go anywhere near that paul also mentions um worship of angels in second colossians so in second colossians worship of angels comes up and it's very interesting because you see angel depictions and um, people making images of angels all over the Xmas season. Xmas season is a time where you're putting um, angel images on top of buildings, um, in front of your house, on your door, all of these things. So you're putting these different idol idols all around your house and you're doing it in the name um, of the Lord you think but you're it's it's not appropriate people haven't studied it out right so the angel is basically saying why do you seek my name it's a hidden thing it's not for you to know right okay and so then samson was conceived let's go to luke 1 11 we're going to talk about um zechariah being conceived it's really interesting this section this section of the Torah portion has a lot of the Xmas time topics um, within it. And it's very, very interesting because it's this, I think if you recall, this Torah portion is called Naso, which is an accounting. It's accounting of the people. It's an accounting of where people are at before they head to the land. So they're, they're seeing what position everyone is in and, you know, people are making vows. People are um, having, adulterous bride tests 
it's such a picture of us being counted and sifted. And this week, I noticed there was a huge sifting going on. And there was a huge accounting going on. And the people were being sifted. And it happens every year kind of in cycles. I found it very, very interesting. But a lot of this stuff is very Xmas related and Sukkot related. So we talked about Sukkot imagery. And then we've talked about a lot of the Xmas imagery, the false imagery that comes up. And so when we look at the we look at the conception of Zechariah, um, when you study out the conception of Zechariah, you can actually link it back to through Josephus. So Josephus has a record of the different priestly um, when the priests went to go work in the temple, they had a schedule. So he has the old schedule for the priests when they were working in the temple. And so through that old schedule, when they were working in the temple, you can figure out when Zechariah probably went home and conceived John with his wife because he was working in the temple. The angel visited him, which we're going to read about right now. And then he went home and conceived because he would have not have been having relations with his wife while he was working in the temple. So when they were working in the temple, they abstained from relations, uh, they abstained, abstained from strong drink, um, and all of those sorts of things as acting as priests in the temple as well, right? Let's go to Luke one eleven. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. For your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Okay, so what's interesting here is you'll notice, I just want to repeat this language for you, and then I'm going to show you something else. Um, so he must not drink wine or strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to Yehovah, their Elohim. And he will go before them in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Okay. So people are waiting for Elijah to return. But it is saying here, he will go before them in the spirit and in the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and make ready for Jehovah a people prepared. So what is Elijah returning? It's the spirit and power to turn the hearts of the fathers of the children and the disobedient uh disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready for Yehovah a people prepared. Let's go to Malachi. So Malachi is the last book in the, the Tanakh or the Old Testament, which I don't know how to spell Malachi. Apparently. Um, I'm just going to go to the very end. It's a very short book. Should we just read the whole thing? Let's just read all of Malachi. Why not? Might as well, right? Well, maybe it's a bit longer than, no, let's not read it all. We've gone through a lot today. Um, Malachi 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when the arrogant and the evil evildoers will be stubble. And on that day, on that the day that the day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says Jehovah of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Um, burning oven. 
burning oven is a symbol that pops up from time to time. The first instance of a burning oven is Abraham when he's making the covenant for the land. Um, and he cuts the pieces in the valley of decision. And the he, Abraham falls asleep and the burning torch and the oven go through the pieces. And it's a picture of, um, uh, do we get into that today? It's a picture of the lampstand of the whole spirit of Yehovah, like a burning oven, like a torch going through the pieces. Yehovah making that covenant on our behalf. So Abraham was supposed to make the covenant for the land, but then Yehovah came in and made the covenant on his behalf. He came in and signed the covenant for him. Um, the day is coming. Uh, the day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says Yehovah of hosts, and it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing on its wings, and you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, and they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, uh, says Yehovah of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moshe. And the statutes and rules that I commanded him at, at Horeb for all of Israel. Okay. This is the last book before the New Testament starts. And this is the last chapter of the last book before the New Testament starts. And there is a reminder. Remember the, the law of my servant Moses and all the statutes and rules which I commanded him at Horeb for all of Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of Jehovah comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their father, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So when you see Elijah the prophet returning, it could be a very literal Elijah the prophet returning, or it could be in the spirit and power, just like it was with John, right? Is there anything else we wanted to cover today? Oh, yes, this is what I wanted to cover. So Zechariah went to go speak uh, against what Yehovah had just declared through the angel of Yehovah. So Zechariah is told by the angel of Yehovah, this is going to happen. X, Y, and Z is going to happen. And what does he say? How shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. So he starts to speak against the prophecy. He starts to speak and whine in the wilderness, you know, and start to speak against what the angel had just told him. <clears throat> and so what does the angel do in order to make sure that Zechariah didn't continue in his speaking words? That's how powerful our words are. He's, he made it so he could not speak until the baby was born, until John was born. Um, so be careful what you say. Watch your mouth. All right, that is all. I am going to stop the recording and we can talk about whatever you like.